and 60. Um, and then later tonight when I get home, I'm going to uh, post the solution answer key so you guys can see how I worked everything out and like my explanations for everything. Um, my name is Sun. Um, it's my, my full name is Sun Me, but I prefer to go by Sun. Uh, if you guys can just hold questions until the end, I have like, um, I think we're going to get through this a little bit faster than I have set up. Um, but I will give you guys time to ask questions. That way I can uh, answer them all at once. If you guys want to write them down when you have them so you don't forget them, that would be good. Okay. Um, yeah. But um, if you can't see what I'm writing, oh, it's up. Yay. Is it on this computer? Uh, yeah, I couldn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's up. Just as a little disclaimer, um, this isn't meant to be like a comprehensive review of your course. This isn't going to be like a direct reflection of your test. It's just what I thought would be a good thing to go over with you guys. I picked about five or six questions per chapter. Um, that I thought were multi-part and comprehensive. And then some of the harder chapters, um, I allotted more questions. So chapter nine probably has like more than five questions, maybe seven or 10, um, because I thought that that was something that students traditionally struggle with and I wanted to go over it with you guys. Um, and at the very end of the study union session, I will ask you guys to fill out a paper survey. Um, so if you guys could do that for me, um, it, re it really means a lot to us. And we want to give you guys a better study in every year, so that would mean a lot. Um, before I start, do you guys have any questions for me at all? Yes. Is the chapter 10 through 12 basically at the end or is it like 10 through 12? Yes, minus chapter 5. That's it. That was it. I thought I did something wrong. Yeah, 5 is at the very end um, because 5 is gas laws, but 4 and 6, up till chapter 6, that would be Chem 1A, and that's all like stoichiometry and properties of matter and things like that. Do we have any other questions? Nope? Okay. Okay. Let's see if I can pull this up. Thank you so much, Lucille. Yeah. going on. So this is going to be a mix of um, free response and multiple choice, mostly multiple choice. Um, but if you guys like wanted to print this out and redo it at home, I have everything on there like a periodic table for you. Um, do you guys get a formula sheet on your ACS? No idea? Okay. Um, I didn't provide a formula sheet because from my understanding I didn't receive a formula sheet, but um, I think you guys are required to memorize your equations. Yeah, so I didn't provide one with this one because, right. So okay. there are um, ACS lessons on this one? No, this is just something that I made from like various resources like your textbook or things online. But in the actual one day exam or was it? I'm not sure. I, w I don't want to say like you will. I didn't get one on my ACS exam. Okay. Yeah. So I'm honestly not sure. <sighs> All right. Any last minute questions before I just like jump in and we start? No, nope, we're good. Okay. So I'm thinking I might just like leave this up here. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and I'll like write over it. Does that work for you guys? Okay. Everyone can see. So the first question is just a states of matter um, and classification kind of question. So let's classify each substance as a pure substance or a mixture. And it says to um, go even deeper and tell us if it's an element or a compound or homogeneous or heterogeneous. So um, I'm going to write the little, wow, it's bright, the little flow chart that I always use. 
So matter can either be a mixture or a pure substance. And under that mixture, you can have homogeneous and heterogeneous. Under this, you can have element and compound. Most of all matter will fit under this little tree. Um, so let's go through these one by one and see where they um, fall, right? So sweat. Sweat is a mixture of molecules that comes out when you get hot and whatnot, but it's not um, a pure substance. It's a mixture of molecules. And it's also um, heterogeneous. Um, no, it's homogeneous because it's homogeneous because it is a mixture, but everything inside that mixture is very uniform. So the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous is that everything here is very uniform and it's like, um, it's evenly mixed throughout, right? But in a heterogeneous mixture, maybe you'll have more of one thing toward the top than you will at the bottom. So this one is going to be a mixture and it's gonna be homogeneous. Carbon dioxide is just going to be a pure substance. They don't give you any other information other than carbon dioxide. So you only have CO2. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be a compound, right? Because um, you have multiple elements making a carbon dioxide. You have carbon and oxygen. So this one's going to be, I'm going to put PS for pure substance, and it's going to be a compound. Aluminum is just pure aluminum, so that's also going to be a pure substance. It's going to be an element. And then vegetable soup is going to be a mixture. Um, but typically when you have vegetable soup, it's not going to be evenly mixed. Um, the vegetables will probably go to the bottom of the soup, and then your broth will come up toward the top. This is one of those trickier ones, but if you just kind of sit and think about it, like, oh, well, I mean, what happens to a soup when you just leave it for a while? It's going to um, separate out into a heterogeneous mixture. Um, number two, a small airplane takes off on 245 liters of fuel. If the density of the fuel is 0.821 grams per mil, what is the mass of the fuel? So first thing I do whenever I have like a stoichiometry question is write my givens. So I know my volume is 245 liters. And they also give me the density, 0.821 grams per milliliter. What mass of fuel has the airplane taken on? So we're looking for mass, right? They give us our volume and our density, and we have to use, um, whatchamacallit, stoichiometry in order to find the mass of the fuel that we have. So we're going to start with the 245 liters, and before we do any dimensional analysis, I want to convert this to be consistent with that. So my volume here is in mils, so I'm going to turn that into liters before I do any multiplication. So if it's going to be um, what did I do here? I said, you can go either way. You can convert this into milliliters or this into liters. And actually, it would be easier to convert this into milliliters. So for every one liter, I have 1,000 milliliters. And then I can apply my dimensional analysis so that for every one milliliter, I have 0.821 grams. What happens now is that my liters cancels out and my milliliters cancels out and I'm left with grams. Um, if you guys do this out on your calculator, the final answer that you should get is 201,145 grams. So this is going to be a common theme on the ACS. Um, they'll give you a lot of answers that look really similar, and then maybe they'll um, change the multiplier, or they'll give you a different unit, or they'll give you the wrong unit altogether, right? So because it asks for mass, and this is a unit of volume, we can automatically get rid of D and E, right? Um, we know that another way to talk about grams, we can convert it to kilograms, right? And that's just a multiplier. So it would look something like this. So if we compare those two answers to this, we know that this isn't the right answer. We have a 21, 201,000 grams, so that's not right. Um, and it could be, what did I do here? It would be, it could be either. I th I, sorry, this is a mistake on my end. It could be either. Um, so the answer in your um, 
answer key is going to be A, but either A or C is correct, and I shouldn't have put both of these. This is my bad. I made this test, so I thought I checked all the um, errors out, but yeah. So then I'm going to erase this and keep going. You guys are also free to like take pictures if you want. Um, you don't even have to ask. So are you, go you guys good if I erase this? Yeah? Okay. So it says an acetaminophen suspension for infants contains 80 milligrams per 0 0.80 milliliters suspension. Um, the recommended dose is 15 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. How many milliliters of the suspension should be given to an infant weighing 14 pounds? And I also give you a little conversion here. Assume two significant figures. So this is also stoichiometry and dimensional analysis. Before I do anything with this weight, I have to turn it into kilograms in order to start using these givens. So I'm going to say that for every one kilogram, we have 2.20462 pounds. The next thing that I'm going to do is use that conversion. No, I'm not. I'm going to use this one. In order to cancel out my kilograms, I'm going to put kilograms on the bottom here. 15 milligrams up here. So what do I have so far? I can get rid of my pounds and get rid of kilograms. Then I'm going to use this conversion here. For every 80 milligrams, I'm going to get 0 0.80 milliliters. So now my milligrams cancels out, and I'm left with this unit, which is consistent with how many milliliters of the, of the suspension I need to be giving them. Um, just as an aside, if you guys can, always try to write your units out. I know it's a little bit more time consuming, but um, using your units to help you make sure you're doing your math correctly is typically really useful. So once you do the math out for this, you should get 6 point, no, point 0.95 milliliters. Um, and again, a lot of these will look very similar. Um, the answer here would be this one, 0.95, yeah. And then for number four, a hydrogen-filled balloon is ignited and 1.5 grams of hydrogen is reacted with 12 grams of oxygen. Just also as an aside, hydrogen and oxygen are um, two of your diatomic elements. Um, Diatomic elements are ones that exist with two atoms side by side, just in their natural state. Um, and you are uh, required to know what those are. So um, an easy mnemonic that I use is called Brinkelhoff. All of these elements are diatomic in their natural state. So I'm going to look for the mass of the water vapor that forms. I'm looking for mass of water vapor that forms. This is a multi-part um, question that requires you to know how to do limiting reagent, identifying the limiting reagent, and then doing stoichiometry. So let's find the limiting reagent first. We, we have 1.5 grams of hydrogen to work with, and I'm going to turn that into moles just to equalize everything. Um, one mole of H2 is going to be 2.02 grams. Um, make sure you're using the molar mass for H2, not just hydrogen. Um, once you do that out, you'll get 0.742 moles of hydrogen. And then once I do the same thing for oxygen, nope, 32.0 grams. That will be 0.375 moles of oxygen. Um, so once we do this, we can go on to find how many moles um, of water that will be formed um, using 
oxygen and hydrogen being combined. So in this case, it will look like this, right? Um, for every one mole of oxygen that is used, you're going to get two moles of water. And for every two moles of hydrogen that's used, you're going to get two moles of water as well. Um, also, as an aside, whenever you guys have an equation that's given to you or that you can figure out, don't forget to balance it because that will help you determine what your mole ratio is going to be. So looking at this, I know that for every one mole of oxygen, I need two moles of hydrogen. Um, and so I'm going to write it like this. For one mole of oxygen, I need two moles of hydrogen. And for every one mole of oxygen, I'm going to get two moles of water. For every two moles of hydrogen, I'm going to get two moles of water. I'm going to keep working with oxygen for now. 0 0.03, 0 0.375 moles of oxygen. So like I said here, for every two moles of water, I'm going to need one mole of oxygen. And then this moles of oxygen down here will cancel out, and I will get 0 0.75 moles of water. That is made from my original amount of oxygen. Um, and then once I do this, I'm going to, because they asked me for the mass of water vapor that forms. So I'm going to use my molar mass of water to convert this. So for every one mole of water, it's going to be 18.02 grams, which will give me, if I do the math out, it will give me 13.5. The answer in this case will be this one. You can't use A or C, or E for that matter, because these are on moles and they ask for the mass, and then this is not the right answer. Um, and the reason that I used oxygen, I realized in this case, instead of hydrogen, is because I, I can recognize oxygen as my limiting reactant. If I convert, if I use my mole ratio, I know that I'm going to have excess hydrogen and not enough oxygen, so I have to use the moles of oxygen that I have in order to go on with the math. Mm -hmm. can you that in I can, yeah. So I'll write it over here. If they give something to you in grams, you're going to have to convert that to moles. Uh, so grams of substance one, you're going to convert it to moles of substance one. And then typically, you're going to have to use a mole ratio, a ratio here, to figure out how many uh, moles of substance one I need in order to make moles of substance two or three or whatever. Two or three. And then if they ask for the number of moles of your product, then you stop there. But if they ask for the mass of your product, you have to use molar mass again to get back to the grams of substance, two or three, or whatever you're looking for. So going from grams to moles, you use this molar mass, which I represent using mu. And then here, you use a ratio, and then you use your molar mass again in order to get to your final product. That's like the core of most of the stoichiometry. That is done in chemistry. I did three and four, two, five, and six. So fill in the blanks to complete the table. Um, what do they give us here? They give us our element that we're working with, the ion that it forms, and we're expected to tell them how many protons and electrons are going to be in this element. So I'm going to go back and find. Here it is. So this review will have a periodic table for you guys. Calcium, um, the, the, the atomic number is going to be the same number as the number of protons inside of an element. So if you find calcium on a periodic table, the big number at the top is going to be 20. That's the number of protons that it has. So in this case, it's going to be 20. And it says number of electrons in the ion. In this case, they give us the ion that's formed. And it has a 2 plus charge, which means it's going to be losing two negatively charged particles. So you're going to lose two electrons. 
So that's going to be 18. Because in any neutral atom, the number of protons and electrons is going to be equal. But in an ion, the number of protons and electrons are going to be not equal. Beryllium, where's beryllium on this? Is, its atomic number is going to be 4. And they give us the ion form, the number of electrons, so we just have to fill this in here. Selenium is going to be, where's selenium? Um, atomic number 34. And we're required to figure out what, it's, um, what the ion it forms is going to be. So selenium is in row 6A, which means the type of ion it's going to form is going to be a 2 minus. Um, a 2 minus means that it's going to gain two negatively charged particles. So it's going to be um, 34 plus 2, which is going to be 36. And then indium is number 49. Yes. And that is going to be in row 3A. If you guys have your periodic table in front of you, it's going to be in row 3A, which means that it's going to form a 3 plus ion. So it's going to have, right? Yeah. It's going to lose three electrons. Um, so it's going to be 49 minus 3, which is going to be 46. Um, you can determine what kind of ion it forms depending on what column or um, group it is in the periodic table. And then depending on whether this is a plus or a minus sign, you know whether you have to add or subtract um, that number from the atomic number in order to get the electron number. Yes? Never. Um, the number of protons is what is going to give an element its identity. Yeah. Number six, calculate the number of atoms in a sample of 1.87 grams of bismuth, I believe. So they give us 1.87 grams of bismuth to begin with. So before I do anything, I'm going to go through it conceptually with you guys. I'm going to go from grams to moles of bismuth. And then in order to get to the number of atoms, I have to multiply by this thing called Avogadro's number. Um, so I have to use the molar mass of bismuth. For every one mole of bismuth that I have, it's going to be 208.98 grams, which I got from the periodic table. Grams cancels out. And every one mole of bismuth, has Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So I'm going to get rid of this because that cancels out. And once I multiply across, my final answer should be 5.38 times 10 to the 21st atoms. Knowing this, I'm going to look at my answer choices, and it looks like this one. Just also um, a tip, once you're, when you're doing math, especially in stoichiometry, um, don't round in the middle. Always use the answer that you got in your calculator. Input the whole thing. Because if you round, it will throw your answer off by a few digits. And sometimes that's enough to make you miss the question. So do your best not to round. Yeah, five and six. Seven, write the balanced chemical equation for the reaction for aqueous sodium carbonate with an aqueous copper chloride to form solid copper carbonate and aqueous chloride. So, huh, I don't have a lot of room. So I'm going to, what am I going to do? I think I'll do number eight first, and then I'll erase it, and then I'll do number seven, because um, I don't have any room to do it. Um, so for number eight, calculate the empirical formula for caffeine based on its elemental mass percent composition. So they give us for carbon, 49.48, hydrogen, 5.19, nitrogen, 28.85, and oxygen. Whenever they give you anything for empirical, all of your percentages have to add up to 100%. 
So what you can do is assume that um, every, if, if you assume that the percentages can be grams, these all add up to 100 grams, right? So that helps us a lot with, um, it's just a shortcut in order to help us determine the number of moles that are present. So what we're going to do is convert everything here um, into moles. So I'm going to use the molar mass for all of these compounds. So for every one mole of carbon, it's going to be 12.01 grams. One mole of hydrogen is 1.01. .01. One mole of nitrogen is 14.01 grams. And then one mole of oxygen is going to be 16 grams. The number of moles that I get for each of them will be 4.1199 moles carbon. This will be 5.13861 moles. Hydrogen, 2.0592. 0 0.9175. What this, what you can do now, um, as you look and compare to all of these, is um, typically what you can do is divide by the smallest number and divide every single one of those by that number. Um, but in this case, this is nearly one, and all of these are very close to a whole number. So I'm going to say this is four, this is five, two, and one. And what that does is it gives me a ratio between each of these elements. So carbon is going to be four, hydrogen five, nitrogen two, and oxygen is just going to be one. So it's going to be C4, H5, and 2O, and the answer here will be A. Does everyone understand when I do this dimensional analysis? You can, um, but it doesn't actually make a difference in the end if you divide by the smallest number. So if you turn this into decimals and then you did the molar mass like you were saying, you would get different answers, right? And then you find between one, two, three, and four, um, let's say number four is the smallest, so you divide all of these by that number. I would divide this by 0.91, this by 0.91, and so on. And then you should get the same numbers here, no matter what. So I'm going to erase 8, and I'm going to do the work for 7 down here. I'm going to use, it says write the balanced chemical equation for aqueous sodium carbonate. So essentially what this does is all of these um, compounds are already written down for you. Um, what you need to do in this case is balance the chemical equation, right? So sodium to carbonate plus copper chloride gives us copper carbonate and sodium chloride. What I like to do when I'm balancing is I'm going to write each of these elements and count them. So sodium. Um, carbon, oxygen, chlorine, and copper. And the same thing here. So I start with two, um, one, three, one, and two. And in this case, I'll start with one here, one here, oxygen three, sodium one, and one. So I can see immediately that I have to fix my sodium and my chlorine. And that makes it pretty clear, right? Everything else is the same. So if I do this, then these numbers will turn into two. And then all of the numbers match up. So the only thing that I have to do is add a two at the end. This has a three at the end. This has a two at the end. This is not correct because it doesn't add anything. Did I do the same thing? Oh, no, this is not correct because it has a 2 here. Sorry, I didn't see that. So D would be the correct answer in this case because D is the only one that only adds a 2 at the end. I did 8. Nine and then ten. 
So let's do nine first. Give the acids their proper respective names, H3PO4 and H2SO3. This is a nomenclature question. Um, I do have a little trick for determining the names of your oxy acids. So, but it does require that you know your polyatomic ions, right? So if your polyatomic ion here and here, if this ends in, um, what is it? It's ick. Ick. It's eight. So if you ate something bad, you feel ick. Right? And then if there is a snake bite, and it turns out to be venomous, something like that. So ate something, you feel ick. If you get a snake bite, and it, it could be venomous. Um, this, I just make really silly mnemonics to help me remember certain things. So this right here is PO4 3 minus. And we know that because of the charge balance. And this is SO3 2 minus. This is phosphate, and this is sulfite. So I know that this is going to turn into phosphoric. This is going to turn into sulfurous acid. And the only thing that works here is phosphoric and sulfurous. So this is B. Copper fluorine contains 37.42 fluorine by mass. Calculate the mass of fluorine in grams. That is in 55.5 grams of copper to fluoride. So you start with 55.5 grams of copper fluoride. And I know there's a two here because I balance my charges. Um, I know that 37.42% of that is going to be Fluorine. So I'm going to multiply that by its decimal. And my answer should give me the mass of fluorine in grams that's going to be in that. So this is just a percentage problem. It's also checking to make sure that you know, um, well, actually, no, it's not. And then. Urea is a common fertilizer that is synthesized by the reaction of ammonium or ammonia with carbon dioxide. So they give us our balanced equation, and it says in an industrial synthesis, they combine 136.4 kilograms of ammonia with 211 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And then they give us, okay, we got this much of our product. Um, we have to find the limiting reagent, the theoretical yield, and the percent yield. So why am I going to do my work here? I'll just do it around it. So I know that they combine 136 point, yeah, four kilograms of ammonia with 211.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide, and they get 168.4 kilograms of our product urea. What we're going to do is we're going to start with ammonia, and um, I have to turn that into the number of moles that is present, right? So 136.4 kilograms. I can't apply its molar mass directly because it's in kilograms, so I'm going to multiply it by 1,000 grams. One, two, three. Um, one kilogram. And then I'm going to apply its molar mass. So um, ammonia's molar mass is going to be 17.04 one mole, and the amount of moles that I get is 8,004.69. If you ever got a number that large, typically you would know that it's wrong because that is a lot, but they do say that it's an industrial synthesis, so in this case your number wants to be big. The molar mass of ammonium, ammonia, just as a side note, does everyone understand how I'm getting my molar mass as I just add the elements, right? I'm going to do the same thing here with carbon dioxide. So 
and 11.4 kilograms. I'm going to multiply by 1,000 grams. And then I'm going to use its molar mass here, which is going to be 44.01 grams for one mole. Kilograms and grams cancels out to give me 4,803.45 moles. So what I'm comparing now in order to find my limiting reactant is the number of moles of ammonia versus the number of moles I have of carbon dioxide. And the thing that I'm going to use to compare between them is my, um, my, my molar ratio, which is 2 to 1. So for every 2 moles of ammonia, I need 1 mole of carbon dioxide and vice versa, right? And this is what I have to work with. So if I were to use um, all of my carbon dioxide, 4.8 K, right? Then I would need double that. And that means like, what is 4.8 4 K times two? That would give me like 9.6. And I don't have 9,600 moles of ammonia. So I know, in this case, that my limiting reactant is ammonia. I just don't have enough of it if I were to try to use all of my carbon dioxide. So in this case, my limiting reactant is ammonia. So I can get rid of B and D, because I know that it's ammonia. Knowing that I have to go and find my theoretical yield, right? So I'm going to cross this out all the way so I don't get confused. I take this number, 8,004.69 moles. And I need to find the number of moles of uh, what is it, urea here that I would get theoretically in a perfect world if all of my ammonia uh, was efficiently converted into product. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to apply my mole ratio. So for every two moles of urea, this is urea, not urea, ammonia, sorry, I'm going to get one mole of my product, which is urea. So Essentially what I'm doing is I'm dividing by 2. I'm going to get 4,002.347 moles of urea. Right? So this is my theoretical yield. And my theoretical yield here is in kilograms. So in order to determine what my theoretical yield is going to be, I have to do some more analysis. Um, and I'm going to apply my, my molar mass. Yeah. So for every one mole of urea, its molar mass is 60.07. That's going to give me my molar mass in grams. But just, to, just as a warning, they do want you to find it in kilograms. So my gram amount that I get is going to be 240,000 grams. So I know immediately looking at these that my answer is probably going to be C. But I'm going I'm to go through it and do it all the way with you guys, right? So. This is going to be 240 kilograms-ish. And then the last thing I have to do is find my percent yield. So what they gave me, what they determined in an experiment versus what I calculated mathematically, I should have gotten 240,000 grams in a perfect world. But they actually got 168.4 kilograms, right? So I'm going to put actual over theoretical to get my percent equals actual over theoretical. It's going to be 168.4 kilograms divided by 240.4. Uh, and if you multiply that by 100, that will give you your percentage. And in this case, it's going to be 70%, which is pretty good for an industrial synthesis. So your answer is going to be C in this case. Yes? So the reaction is the larger? Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to take a drink. <laughs> Not necessarily. Limiting reactant, um, the easiest way that I can think to describe is that you have two baskets, per se, OK? You have a basket of ammonia, and you have a basket of carbon dioxide, right? And you only have this amount to work with. You don't have any more, right? So let's say that I have eight of ammonia. I'm just going to simplify the number so it's easier to work with and 4.8 moles of carbon dioxide, right? And I know that my ratio is that I need two of these for every one of those, right? So you have two scenarios. In scenario one, you're going to use all of your carbon dioxide. 
and then you determine, okay, maybe I'll have enough two left over. But in scenario two, you're gonna use all of your ammonia and you're gonna hope that you have enough carbon dioxide left over, right? So in scenario one, if I use all of my carbon dioxide, right, I need 4.8 moles of carbon dioxide and in order to complete the reaction, I need double that because the molar ratio is one to two. But double 4.8, that's gonna give you 9.6, right? And you don't have 9.6 moles of ammonia. You only have eight. So you just don't have enough of that. That's your limiting reactant. In scenario two, if I used all of my ammonia, right, I need a two to one ratio of that. So I only need four moles of carbon dioxide in order to complete my reaction. So that one would be successful, but in scenario one, I just wouldn't have enough ammonia to complete my reaction if I used all of my carbon dioxide. Does that make sense? Do you, you had a question. Yeah, so basically you just look at those two, mm -hmm. like ammonia and nitrogen oxide, mm -hmm. and you realize which one. You will run out of first. Run out of first yeah, because yeah, that's, that's gonna be a limiting reactant. Does that make sense? And the math was all okay? I, I just have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, for the theoretical rule, mm -hmm. I'm still kind of confused. Um, so you did, I don't know, okay, I'm just confused. But how did you get mm -hmm. the limiting? I use my limiting reaction, or my, li my limiting, <laughs> sorry, my limiting reactant, right? And um, what I did was I applied my mole ratio. So if I have this number of moles of urea, how many moles of urea? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm misspeaking left and right. I'm starting over. So I have 8,000 moles of ammonia, which is my limiting reactant. And I know, because they give me this, that for every two moles of ammonia that I use, I get one mole back of my product, urea. So what I did was I took this and I applied a mole ratio. I said for every one mole of urea, I need two moles of ammonia, vice versa. So I divided this by two, because I know that I'm gonna get half the moles of product. So I got 4,000, right? So this is how many moles I would get. But if you look at your answers, your theoretical yield is not in moles, it's in kilograms. So in order to check that, I converted that to kilograms okay. using molar mass. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was a multi-step problem. Are you guys okay with that one? Okay. Determine whether each compound is soluble or insoluble. I have a really dumb mnemonic for solubility rules as well. It's called, um, what do I use? It's called NASH, when you like gnash your teeth. So I'm gonna write that out for you guys in a second. G-N-A-S-H. And this is, um, all of these are soluble. So they're gonna be group one, or group A1, however you want to talk about it, and then nitrates. This is going to be both ammonia, oh sorry, ammonium, there's a difference. This is NH4 plus, and this is also going to be acetate, which looks like this. Sulfates and halogens. Anything written here is going to be soluble. But there are some exceptions for your sulfates and your halogens. Um, so it's going to be, what do I use? Castro bear is happy. That's what I use. Castro bear. So calcium, strontium, and barium. Calcium, strontium, and barium. Calcium, strontium, and barium. And then for halogens, um, I use HAP, which is going to be mercury, silver, and lead. So these are your exceptions like that. Sulfates um, are typically soluble, but if you have calcium sulfate or barium sulfate, that's going to be an exception, and it's not going to um, be soluble. Halogens are almost always soluble as well, right? But if you have mercury fluoride, fluor fluorine is a halogen. That's going to be insoluble, right? So always soluble, these are the exceptions, only for sulfates and halogens. Knowing that, let's look at 12. Determine whether each compound is soluble or insoluble. So A has silver nitrate, and nitrate doesn't have any exceptions, so that one's gonna be soluble all the time. Whenever you see nitrate, it will be. So I'm gonna put a plus, because I can't, I can't reach. Um, 
lead sulfate. Um, so look at your sulfates. Your sulfate exceptions are calcium, strontium, and barium, and lead is not part of your sulfate exceptions. So sulfates are always soluble if it doesn't have anything to do with your exceptions, so this is going to be soluble. Potassium nitrate. Potassium is a group one element, and it also has a nitrate in it, so it is going to be soluble. And then, um, what is this? An ammonium sulfide. Ammonium is also always going to be soluble. I feel like I put a negative for one of these. Remember we had 12? I have insoluble for B on my answer choices, but lead sulfate should be soluble. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna fix that. If you guys wanna bring that up on a Word document and fix that, 12B, the answer should be soluble. I have my answer key incorrect. Um, for this one, write the products and the balanced net ionic equation for the following reaction. So for most of these, um, whenever you get uh, an equation where you're required to find your products, you're just going to switch the cation and the anion like that. So sodium, instead of being paired with uh, phosphate, it's going to be paired with chloride. So you know, I'm not going to do any ions yet. I'm just going to write my products. It's going to be sodium chloride. And then you're going to have nickel and phosphate. So in this case, before I do that, I need to make sure I understand what my charges are for my atoms. So nickel, in this case, I know is 2 plus because chlorine here has a, has a 2 as a subscript. And in this one, phosphate is going to be PO4, 3 minus. So my product is going to look like this. Just like that. And then it says, write the balanced net ionic equation. So these always take a lot of time. If you ever come across one of these on your test, I would advise just to do it last. Because each question is the same number of points, but certain ones take longer than others. So in this one, I'm going to write out all of my ions. Sodium. I have phosphate. And if I don't write anything, it's going to be aqueous. Um, Nickel, chlorine gives me sodium, and nickel, what is this, 2, PO4, 3 minus. So it says the net ionic equation. Um, so all of my spectator ions are going to get crossed out and you don't have to pay attention to them. What you do have to pay attention to is your nickel and your phosphate. Um, and if you look at this right here, nickel phosphate. Oh, this was a bad question. This is actually going to be so, uh, solid. Um, this isn't covered in the solubility rules. This is one of those weird exceptions where phosphate is typically insoluble. Um, this was a bad example. But this is going to be solid, so these are not going to be crossed out as spectator ions. They're going to turn into this. And then this is in parentheses like this. So you know that your spectator ions get to stay here. and they go to that. So in order to balance that, I know that I have three nickels and two phosphorus. Your final balanced net equation is going to look like this. Um, I do have an insolubility mnemonic. Do you guys, are you interested in that? Do you want me to give you that? Okay. It's harder to remember. Um, but it's just, it's COPS, like this. Um, so that is going to be 
So for this one, I wrote them out like in words. For this one, the mnemonic depends on the ion itself. So for this one, uh, C has two, uh, your carbonate and your chromate ions are always insoluble. And then hydroxide is almost always insoluble. Oxides are insoluble. Um, this one is going to be phosphates. And then sulfites and sulfides. So this is going to be PO4, 3 minus. This is SO4, no, 3, 2 minus, S2 minus. This is carbonate, chromate, hydroxide, and oxides. So the one up top, those are always soluble, and the ones on the bottom, those are always insoluble. Except for hydroxide, but typically that's like 99% of the time they're insoluble. <sighs> yeah? Did you, is it okay if I go on? Did you guys want a picture, or? I was just thinking, uh, mm -hmm. when you were canceling out the structure ions mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. uh, what if we just done that and kind of tried to balance them on both sides first? Mm -hmm. I, because you're going to cancel them out. There's nothing to balance them with on the other side. Okay. So it doesn't actually matter. It's good practice. Would you balance the right. ones that aren't structured uh -huh. that are also in larger ways? Can you repeat that? When you're, ba when you're balancing mm -hmm. the structured ions, um, are, you know, are the same, same amount of moles on both sides? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think so, because what you have here is sodium plus and calcium minus, right? And then you have three here and then two here. But you're going to get rid of this entirely. And when you balance your ions, like you said, what you're doing, you have sodium here and phosphate here, and they're entirely separate. So if you put a three here, a three does not go here. They're mm -hmm. ions that are separate. So I. It's good practice to balance both of them before you cancel out because you need to know how to do your complete ionic equations, which you don't do any canceling out. You write all of them. But in this case, you, you wouldn't really have to because it's an ionic equation. Yeah. OK, are you guys good if I erase this? When is your guys' final? What time? I also have all of my finals on Thursday, so I will be testing with you guys in spirit. Write the product and balanced complete ion equation for the following reaction. So this one, it looks like is acetate. And yeah, so this one's complete. So no, ba no canceling of spectator ions, right? So before I do anything, I'm going to Make sure I know what my ions are. This one's going to be a proton and acetate. This one's going to be potassium and carbonate. And then I know um, in order to get my products, I just switch my cations and anions. So I'm going to get carbonic acid and uh, potassium acetate, like that. So those are just my products. If I wanted to write my complete ionic equation, this would have a 2 here. And um, I have to check my solubility before I do anything, right? So in this one, this is completely aqueous, and then carbonate is typically insoluble. So I'm going to write that, and then this is going to be <coughs> just like that. When I, yeah, actually, I think that's it. CH3, CH3, this is going to be a 2 here because I have two hydrogens here. 
Um, yeah. So I wrote my products, I wrote my ions, and then I balance all of my ions looking at the subscripts on either side. And then this would just go on this line. Um, yeah. And then for number 15, determine whether the reaction is a redox reaction and identify the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. So in order to determine whether a reaction is a redox reaction, we're just going to go through and determine all of their oxidation states and numbers. Um, so I'm going to go through and do every single one of them, um, but just so you guys know, polyatomic ions, their atomic or their oxidation number is typically always the same as their charge. So oxygen is going to be two minus, but I have three of them, right? And that's going to be um, negative six. And then you know that my nitrogen is going to have to have a positive five because nitrate looks like this, right? So my Oxidation numbers have to add up to the whole charge, whether that's neutral, whether it's plus one, minus one, whatnot. Um, and then I know that my whole charge of nitrate is going to be negative one, so I multiply that by two, and that's going to give me a negative two for my whole charge of nitrate, for both of them. And then uh, lead is going to be a positive two. And then you know that that's correct because lead nitrate has a zero overall. Um, so in this case, my individual atoms' oxidation numbers are written on top, and the summed oxidation numbers are going to be written on the bottom. So atoms up here, and the sum down here. Sulfate looks like this. Um, so you know that overall, they need to add up to 2 minus. So oxygen is going to be minus 2, and you're going to have negative, you're going to have 4 of them, so negative 8. Sulfate is in group 6A, so this one its oxidation state is going to be positive 6, actually. Um, and if you have to choose between which one takes the positive, which one takes the negative, oxygen always wins because it's more electronegative. So it's going to have a minus 2. Um, and so you have one sulfate has a negative 2, and you have four. No, no, you don't. You have one sulfate here. Um, my bad. Ignore that. And then sodium is going to have a positive 1, but you have two of those. So your whole net is going to be positive 2 in order to cancel out this negative 2 up here. For this one, same thing. Um, it's going to be minus 2 and then plus 6. Um, so this is going to be positive 2 and this is also going to be, sorry, negative 2 and a positive 2. And then negative 2 times 3. This is negative 6 plus 5. And then that's going to be have negative 1, so this one's going to have a plus 1. So what I have written up here, up top, is the oxidation number for every single atom. I'm going to erase the bottom now, because that was just to help me understand which one was, yeah. So now I'm going to compare the atoms one by one in order to determine whether they got reduced or oxidized. So but, uh, what is it called? Lead. Lead doesn't change. So that wasn't involved in the redox reaction. Let's look at. Nitrogen also doesn't change. Oxygen, wait, what is going on? Nothing changes. Right, so it's not a redox reaction, actually. So <laughs> I got scared for a second. Yeah, that was one of your answer choices. So you can assign all these oxidation states, and if nothing changes, it's not a redox reaction, because there was no transfer of electrons. A redox reaction only happens if electrons were transferred from atom to atom, right? So in this case, we assigned all our oxidation states, and all of them wound up being identical. So a redox reaction didn't even occur. But if, let's say, um, we found that lead's oxidation state changed to positive 3, this is just a hypothetical, um, that means it would have lost an electron, right? And I use oil rig. So oxidation is losing electrons. Reduction is gaining electrons. If lead went from positive 2 to positive 3, it would have lost an electron, so it would have been oxidized. And when something gets oxidized, it acts as a reducing agent. So be careful when you're taking your test to make sure that you're reading what they asked for. Do they get oxidized, or what kind of agent are they? That wording of the question can absolutely change your answer. Yes. 
So that's why I have NA here. If 123 mils of a 1.1 molar glucose solution is diluted to 5 liters, what is the molarity of the diluted solution? So what you're going to use here is M1V1 is equal to M2V2, like this. Um, the only thing that matters, you can use milliliters or liters or whatever for your volume. What matters is that they're the same in both situations. So you'll have 100. 23 milliliters and 5 liters. So those are completely different units. Um, so I'm just going to turn this into 0.123 liters. So knowing that, I have a 1.1 molar glucose solution, and I have 0.123 liters of that. And I need to know the molarity of what's going to happen if I dilute it to 5 liters. So you basically just isolate for M2, um, and your final answer is going to look like this. is going to be B. The air within a piston equipped with a cylinder absorbs 565 joules of heat and expands from an initial volume. Okay, so I have to write my givens here. So the heat that it absorbs is 565 joules. The initial volume of a piston is 0.10 liters, and it goes to a final volume of 0.85 liters. The external pressure is going to be one atmosphere. And they ask us to find the change in external energy. So this is where your equations come in. Um, this is starting into thermo. Um, your change in internal energy is going to be equal to the sum of your heat plus your work. right? And work can also be broken down into um, pressure volume work, which is going to look like this. times volume. And there is a negative here. Um, so what this essentially means is that your delta E is going to be equal to Q plus a negative P times V. We have our pressure. Oh, sorry. This is delta V. I knew I was missing something. Change in V. We have our pressure and our change in volume, and we also have our Q. So at this point, we're just going to plug and chug. It's going to be 565 joules plus negative 1 times final minus initial is going to give me 0.75 liters. Um, so this is going to give me, oh, sorry. OK, hold on. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. This is what happens when I don't write my units. So delta E is equal to Q plus W. And W is equal to negative P delta V. My P is going to be my negative 1 ATM. And my V is going to be final minus initial is going to give me 75, 0.75 liters, right? So what this is, is my work right now is being shown in terms of liters ATM. And I cannot just put that in here. I can't add liters ATMs to joules to get a joule answer. right? So this is why I always say, make sure you use your units, because if your units aren't consistent, you know you're doing your math incorrectly. So there is a conversion to go from liters ATM to joules. And it's for every one liter ATM, that is 101.3 joules. So you're going to multiply this by 101.3 to get negative 76 because your answer right here is negative. So don't forget that negative sign. That's very important. Then I have my W, so I'm going to go over here and add it to my Q. 565 joules plus a negative 76 joule work is going to give me 489 joules. Just this one right here. Yeah, it's a lot. Are you sure? I'm pretty no, sure. I know in 2045 they don't have it. Really? Yeah. For the ACS, they give it to you in 2045? Yeah, we have a whole sheet. We also got some mm -hmm. in the... Oh, really? Yeah. 
That doesn't make sense. I would definitely like ask your teacher or Google. I don't want to give you misinformation. I'm not sure. I know that I didn't get it. For 1B, are you guys all hiders? I'm not 1B. No. Okay. But like uh, one, 2045 goes over the same thing, right? So, yeah. okay. Yeah, I mean. We have, we have the same rules. Okay. I don't, I'm not sure. I know I didn't get it. Um, I don't want to lie to you and be like, you're going to get it or you're not going to get it. So I don't want to say yes or no, but I would definitely ask. Yeah, I don't think you okay. But you guys got your equations, you said? Like yeah. for heat, heat loss? Okay, <laughs> they might give you something like, like this and expect you to know the Q equals M cat or something like that, but um, again, I'm not sure. I know for a fact they won't give you solubility rules. They won't tell you how to find your oxidation numbers, yeah. things like that, yeah. You know what, I think I have the, the handout of the, for HDS exam. Okay. Oh, another thing is that if they do give you your formula sheet, they're not going to give you conversions. Yeah. So they're not going to give you pressure conversions, like 760 equals 1 ATM. Um, so conversions are also your responsibility to know. Did I go over 17? Yeah, I did. Why is this not on the same page? The propane fuel used to burn, used in gas barbecues, burns according to the thermochemical equation that is given. Um, if a pork roast must absorb that many kilojoules to fully cook and only 10% of the heat produced is absorbed by the roast, what mass of carbon dioxide is emitted? So this is kind of difficult to break down. Um, so <laughs> they give us our equation here, right? And this is what we're burning. Um, this right here, our delta H of reaction, says that for every one mole of propane that is burned, that much heat is going to be given off, right? And it's telling us, it's telling us that, okay, it might emit 200 or 20, 44 kilojoules, but of that amount emitted, this pork roast, however, yeah, only 10% of that goes into this pork roast. So it needs to absorb 1.6 times 10 to the third, right? So what this means, if you translate it, is that the amount that we have to burn is 10 times that, right? Because if we burn 1.6 times 10 to the fourth, right, only 10% of that is going to get absorbed by the roast, like this says. And it needs this much to cook. So it says, what mass of CO2 is emitted in the atmosphere during the grilling of a pork roast? Now we have to find mass of carbon dioxide. So this is the setup that we have to understand first. Then we can go on and do the stoichiometry. So I said that in order to fully cook this, this guy, this much, this many kilojoules needs to be emitted. This is our given. Um, and we need to figure out the mass of carbon dioxide. So let's work backwards. If we need to find the mass of carbon dioxide, we're probably going to have to know the moles of carbon dioxide, right? And we can find our moles of carbon dioxide if we find the moles of propane that we burn. Because they give us a 1 to 3 conversion ratio. So I worked backwards, so let's meet it going forwards again. Um, I need to emit this many kilojoules. Um, and that means I need to, if I need 1.6 times 10 to the fourth uh, kilojoules, and this is how much gets um, emitted if I burn one mole of propane. Then I'm going to divide this by that number. And my answer here is going to give me the moles of propane that I'm going to need to burn. 
I'm going to divide the number I need to cook the pork roast by the number that they gave me. And what they'll do is it'll show me how many moles of propane that I need to burn. Once I've gotten the moles of propane, I can turn that into moles of carbon dioxide and find the mass of carbon dioxide. So Can then. Because of the 10 percent. If I emit this much, only 1.6 times 10 to the third is going to be taken into the pork roast. Okay. Right? So I did this times 10 to get this to know how much energy I need to emit in the first place. Yeah. Right? Now that I know how much energy I need to emit in the first place, right? I don't know how many moles this is. This is just a random number that I found. I'm like, okay, I need this much to come off of the propane grill, but this is how much I need coming off of the grill if I burn one mole of propane. So to find the number of moles of propane, I divided this by that number. I found this, and then I'm going to use my mole ratio, which is 1 to 3. to give me 23.4 moles of carbon dioxide. And then I'm going to apply my molar mass, which is 44.01 grams. And my final answer should be 1,033 grams, which is B. So I know that this part was kind of tricky. Yes. OK, so let's say that um, I have pork, OK? And I'm, I don't know how to draw this. I'm just going to draw a box. I have pork, right? And I said, OK, well, if you want to cook this pork, you have to, um, it has to take in four kilojoules of heat, OK? So in order to cook this, it has to take in four kilojoules. Um, and so you would think you just put this in a pan, right? And you just give it four kilojoules of heat, right? But that's not the way that it works. If you put in, uh, if there is four kilojoules of heat being distributed around the bottom of this pan, it only takes in 10% because thermal energy is really inefficient in terms of transfer. So in order to get this to absorb four kilograms, I have to heat this to 40 kilograms because it only takes in 10%. So that's what I did here. From this, I did that. I just multiplied it by 10. Yeah. It's, it, sometimes it's easier to understand if you like break it down or something. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions? Okay. So this is just as like a, I can see that I'm pretty much going to run out of time because I have 45 questions and we're in 19. We have 45 minutes left. So um, I want this to be as helpful for you guys as possible. Just as a side note, I will post all of my work after this. So you will be able to see how I answered every single question. Um, but if there's a chapter that you guys are uncomfortable with right now, I want to I wanna go over it for you guys. So is there anything that you guys want to have a focus on, or should we just go through it? Yours is probably the all over again. Chapter 6? Chapter 4, you said chapter 5. What else? Were these the main things I wanted to hit on? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. What is chapter 8? Electron configuration. Okay. Um, yeah, it's all electron <coughs> configuration. It's periodic trends, that's what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, let's go through 6 and then 4 and then 5. because. Five was something you guys probably learned really recently, right? Okay. <coughs> oh, look at that. I'm actually in chapter six. Yeah, so 17 and 18 were considered chapter six. So we're, gonna, we're just going to keep going through this one. 19. A silver block initially at 58.3 degrees Celsius. is submerged into, oh, this is silver, is submerged into 100 grams of water at 24.8 degrees Celsius, temperature initial of water, 
in an insulated container, the final temperature of the mixture upon reaching thermal equilibrium is 26.2 degrees Celsius. What is the mass of the silver block? And they give you the specific heat. So the temperature final for both of these has to be the same. Because if you have a cup of water, and this water is at 24 degrees, and you take this block and you put it in there, if you leave it for long enough, they're going to reach the same exact temperature. They're going to equilibrate. That's why the temperature final is the same for both. They're asking us to find the mass of the silver block. Right. The equation that I'm going to use for this is Q equals M cat. But I'm going to set two different M cat equations equal to each other. Because the amount of heat that is given off by your silver block has to be taken in by your water. So the Qs are equal but different in sign. So it's going to be um, M cat is equal to negative M cat. And it doesn't actually matter which side you put the sign on. Does this have a liquid though? Yes. Okay. So this is um, coffee cup. So cat is bomb calorimetry. Okay. Um, M cat is coffee cup calorimetry. Cat, when it doesn't have the M, is the bomb calorimeter, I believe, keeps the uh, volume, volume the same. And the pressure gets like really, really high. So it's kind of like a dangerous instrument. Um, okay. And the, uh, the T, or no, the C, the C in cat, it, it has to be given to you. Um, it's found experimentally to be something specific. So if they have to say the word bomb what calorimetry. The it's the specific heat of the of the of like the actual calorimeter the device that you have. Mm -hmm. the, the big C is going to be for your bomb calorimeter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For this guy. Yeah. Was it on the day? I don't remember it honestly. I I yeah, like. I guess. <laughs> I guess you can use that. Um, this is honestly. I had a lot of trouble with chapter six. So. That's really funny. I'm going to use that now. <laughs> I'm going to use that now. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, I'm going to use that now. I'm going to remember that. You need a lot of coffee for the cat. Okay. So this one is going to be for my silver. And this one is going to be for my water. And yeah, if, you're, if they want you to use the cat equation, they have to say the word bomb calorimetry so you know which equation to use. Okay. Um, yes? Sorry, just why did you do the negative bomb calorimetry? So the, remember when I drew the water and the uh, silver block going in? The, the heat, so there's no such thing as cold, technically. It's just an absence <laughs> of heat, right? So when something gets cold, it loses heat. So that, this guy cooling means this guy warms up a little bit. So mm -hmm. the silver block cooling means that the water warms up. So the transfer of heat goes from your silver block to your water. So that's what this is showing. This is losing heat, and this is gaining heat, or vice versa. And like I said, it doesn't matter which side the negative is on. Yeah. So we're, we're looking for the mass of the silver block. That's it. So that one's going to be a variable. Our specific heat of silver is given to us. So that's 2.235 joules, grams, degrees centigrade. And then our temperature final is going to be 26.2 minus 58.3 degrees Celsius. And then this is going to be our mass of water, which is 100 grams. Uh, specific heat of water is 4.18 joules, grams Celsius. And then we're going to do 20, 26.2 minus 24.8. So we have everything. We're just looking for M, Mg, Mag now. right? So you're just going to take this and divide it by all of this, and you, you'll get your mass of silver. Um, that's going to give you 77.09. So what you did is, you let's say that this is x. 100 times 4.18 times this minus that. That's going to be x, right? And you're, you're going to divide x by y, which is this, right? So 0.235 times this difference in temperature. This is going to give you, sorry, there is a negative sign there. Don't forget that. So this is going to be negative divided by a negative, because this is a smaller minus a larger number. 
And your final answer is going to be positive because you divide a negative by negative. Also, if you get a negative number for your mass, you know that it has to be positive because mass is a negative. <sighs> yeah. Um, so 20 is Hess's law. I'm going to scroll up because that always takes up a lot of room. Use the following reactions and given delta H's um, to find the delta H reaction for this. So for Hess's law, um, whatever you do to your equation, you also have to do to your enthalpy values. So our goal is to rearrange and multiply our three equations to sum up to this equation. Um, so let's start with carbon. Um, we have five carbon solids that we need on the left, right? So the only carbon solid that I need, that I see is here, and it has to be five. So I'm going to multiply everything here by five, including my delta H value for that. And then let's look at hydrogen. Um, the only hydrogen that I see is here. Yeah, and it has to be six. I'm going to multiply everything here by three. So two times, si two times three is six. 1 times 3 is 3, and then 2 times 3 is 6. So I'm going to multiply this by 3 as well. And then I have to have my, um, I forgot what that was called. I haven't taken it yet. It's five, C5H12. Um, and that has to be on the, on the right side. Um, so what I'm going to do is, there's nothing wrong with the coefficient. It's, it is as it is. I'm just going to reverse this. So I'm going to multiply everything by negative 1. When you multiply by a negative number, you're essentially reversing the direction so that it goes this way instead of that way. So then once you sum everything up, I'm just going to add everything up here. I'm going to wind up getting 5 carbon solid, right, plus 5 oxygen. Um, and then I'm also going to add up these guys, plus 6 hydrogen, plus 3 oxygen. And then this is technically now the left side of my equation, right? Because I reversed it. So I'm also going to add these guys. 5 carbon dioxide plus 6 water, which is going to give me, and now I'm going to write everything on the right side of my equation, which is 5 carbon dioxide plus 6 water plus, now this is the right side of my equation, C5H12 plus 8O2. So, what you can do now is, if you have the same thing on the left and the right side of the arrow, they will cancel completely, right? So I have five carbon dioxide on the left side of the arrow, and I have five carbon dioxide on the right side of the arrow, and those just negate, like that. Same thing with the water. I have six on each side, right? So the only thing left on this side of the arrow now is, wait, no, I didn't write this. Yes, I did. It's eight oxygen. So now I need to get rid of the oxygen, because that's not on this side of the arrow. So let's look at the oxygen, right? So I have five oxygen here and three oxygen here, which sum up to eight. So I can cancel everything out here. And now, the only thing I have left is my carbon, my hydrogen, uh, yeah, and my product. So that was just a check to make sure that everything cancels out to get my topmost equation. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum all of these in the same exact way. So now this is going to be positive. 3,244.8. This is going to be negative and negative, and then it's going to be 5 times 393.5, 3 times 483.5. And when I add all of that up, my answer is going to be negative 173.2 kilojoules. And it is negative. Is it negative? Yes. So um, I did already go through chapter four because that was earlier. That was all limiting reactants um, and oxidation. And then I just finished chapter six. 
this is going into chapter seven, which is your uh, quantum mechanics chapter. So then I'm going to go to five for now so that we can cover that. And then when we have time, we'll go back here. So determine the density of a sample of argon gas at 55 degrees and 765 millimeters of mercury. So our density equation is going to be pressure times molar mass over R times T, right? Um, our R is a constant that we have to know. It's 0 0.08206. Um, and then our pressure changes depending on which R that we use. So if we're going to use the one I just said, our pressure always has to be in atmospheres. So 765 millimeters of mercury. In order to uh, turn that into ATM, I have to do my conversion factor, which is going to be, yeah, 1.00653. Seven ATM. So in order to plug that in, I'm going to do this. My molar mass of argon can just be found if I look on my periodic table. That's going to be 39.95 grams per mole. My R value is 0 0.08206 liters ATM over moles Kelvin, which tells me that my temperature also has to be in Kelvin. So it's going to be 55 plus 273. If I do all of this math, that will give me my density, and you should come out to a final answer of 1.49 uh, grams per liter. That's the um, molar mass of argon, and it's just going to be on your periodic table. A 255 milliliter gas sample contains argon and nitrogen at a temperature of 65 degrees Celsius. The total pressure of the sample is 725 millimeters of mercury. So PT, 725 millimeters of mercury. And the partial pressure of argon is 231. So P argon is going to be 231 millimeters of mercury. What mass of nitrogen is present in the sample? So our volume is also given to us. And I'm going to put that in liters. We have a gas sample inside of a jar, right? And let's say this whole thing is 225 mils. We have argon floating around, and we have nitrogen floating around. So um, Dalton's law of partial pressure just says that the partial pressure of every single element has to add up to equal the total pressure inside of the entire container. So what I'm going to do is this is a gas law problem that has two or three steps. So the gas law or the ideal gas law equation is PV equals nRT. Um, and if I put in the pressure of nitrogen, I will get the moles of nitrogen or vice versa, right? So the pressure and the number of moles is linked depending on which partial pressure that you use. If you use the pressure, if you use the total pressure, you get the total number of moles of everything. But if you use the partial pressure of nitrogen, you'll only get the moles of nitrogen, which is what we want because we're looking for the mass of nitrogen, right? So what we're going to do is in order to find the pressure of nitrogen, we're going to do PT minus pressure of argon is equal to PN. So it's going to be 725 minus 231, which is going to give me 494, you said? This is millimeters of mercury. Why did I do this one differently? I don't know, but. Um, this is 494 millimeters of mercury, and then in order to plug that into my PV equals nRT equation, I have to convert that into ATM because millimeters of mercury doesn't go in directly. Uh, 760 millimeters of mercury by one ATM. Can somebody do that for me? Oh. 
Okay. What have I done here? Mm, okay. So then if I plug in this to get my volume to 25 liters equals N, 0 0.08206 liters ATM, moles of Kelvin, and then my temperature is in Kelvin. So that's going to be 273, which is 8, 1, 4, 3, 348 Kelvin. Um, if I find the number of moles of nitrogen, that is going to give me 38. Thank you. I think I did my work in like entirely differently, so. But they're both, like, there are always multiple ways to solve math problems in chemistry. Um, the number of moles that I will get is 0 0.0087. No, this is total. What N do you guys get when you do this? So this is moles of nitrogen. And this is, of course, nitrogen gas. So it's going to be N2. And so for every one mole of N2, we're going to have 28.02 grams. So if you multiply this by that, how many grams of nitrogen do you guys get? Huh. That's weird. So we got the right number, but it's not the right. Hmm. What did I do wrong? It is milliliters, point zero two. Are we supposed to be using that term again? Uh, well, it is. It's in liters ATM. I don't think so. We have the right number, and it. I did use the right molar mass for a diatomic element. I don't know what I could have done wrong here. Can I redo the math? That would fix it. Um, so the N, um, I just did it on my calculator, should be 0 0.00597. So then this grams would have done that. Yeah. OK. Let's go on to the next few problems. Yes, but you do have to use a partial pressure of nitrogen. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. And then um, some people will convert this to ATMs first and then subtract the ATM of the total pressure minus the ATM of the argon. But like, I find it easier to just subtract this and do it once. Right. Um, I mean, it, you'll still get the right answer. Um, yeah. It's just that it takes more time, yeah. Um, so it's easier to just, you can just subtract this to get your partial pressure of nitrogen in millimeters of mercury and just convert once rather than doing it twice, yeah. But like I said, you will still get the right answer. If that's easier for you, then yeah. So 43, which gas sample has the greatest volume at standard temperature and pressure? Where did my notability app go? There it is. Um, as a 
just a kind of reminder, STP is different from uh, standard conditions. So standard temperature and pressure is going to be where temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and pressure is 1 atm. But standard conditions, the temperature is 0 degrees Celsius. So those, those are very easy to mix up. Just know that for this one, STP is typically for your gas laws. So STP gas laws is 25 degrees Celsius and 1 atm. But your standard conditions is probably going to be for enthalpy, like chapter 6, things like that. Uh huh. That's probably standard conditions. But STP for gas laws, I know for a fact, is 25 degrees Celsius. Is that wrong? I mean, I can do a Google search. It's important to know the difference because um, they're very confusing. There we go. STP is zero, standard conditions. Okay, it was, it was switched, it was my bad. So STP is going to be zero, but standard conditions is going to be 25. So let's do this again. Really? Really? For chapter 26, it's not there? Okay. Then if you guys have never heard standard conditions, then this is just zero degrees Celsius and then one ATM. Um, okay, so which gas sample, I could have sworn I learned that in Chem 1. Which gas sample has the greatest volume at STP? So this goes back to that conversion, which I'm going to do the work down here because it's hard to reach up there. Um, one mole of any gas, no matter what it is, is 22.4 liters, no matter what it is. One mole of that gas. Um, so what this is saying is which sample has the greatest volume at STP, right? If you read through it really fast, you would be like, oh, these are all the same uh, amount. And so you might say that like they all have the same volume. But that's not true because this is giving us our amount in weight, and we need it in moles. So we need to convert all of these to moles. That is a really tricky pitfall to fall into, so just be aware of that. So you're going to use 10 grams of argon, and for every one mole, of argon, that's 39.95 grams. So you'll get 0.25 moles. For krypton, you will get 0.119 moles. And for xenon, if you use its molar mass, you'll get 0.076 moles. So now that you have everything in the same unit and at the um, conversion you want, volume, right? Um, you're going to compare this. So obviously, if something has more moles, it's going to take up more volume, because now we can com compare all of our units to the same unit as is in the conversion. So the element with the greatest number of moles is going to take up the greatest amount of space in terms of volume. And so argon, in this case, because it has the smallest molar mass, is going to um, take up the greatest amount of volume at STP. Point zero seven six. Oh. Yes. Um, because I took the 10 grams and I divided it by the molar mass and I got that. A gas sample has a volume of 178 mils at zero degrees Celsius. The temperature is raised until the volume is 211. The temperature is raised until the volume is 211 milliliters. What is the temperature of the gas sample in Celsius at this volume? So this is um, giving us an initial volume, right? An initial volume of 178 mils and an initial temperature at zero degrees Celsius. And it says after something was done to it, the second volume is going to be 211 mils. So we have to find the second temperature. and um, the relationship between volume and temperature, um, I think, is Boyle's law. Um, so it's going to be V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. So we set up a proportion, um, but we can't use zero. Because if we put zero in our proportion, then we wouldn't be able to find our x, right? So um, we have to use Kelvin. 
Because right, if I put a 0 here, then how would I possibly find my temperature? So it works the same. You don't have to always convert to Kelvin. It's just that in this case, because you're Celsius to 0, you can't have a 0 number. You have to use a non-zero number. If they gave me 25, for example, that would work just fine. So my T2 here um, is going to be 328, no, 323.8 Kelvin. Um, but that is not one of our answers. Um, so what they're probably looking for is our number in Celsius. 273, which will give us 51 degrees Celsius, which is one of our answers, and it's D. A 1.25 gas sample occupies that much volume. What is the molar mass of the gas? So they give us volume? No, they give us mass. They give us volume. Temperature. Pressure. And we have to find the uh, molar mass of the gas. Um, which is mu, actually, which is not one of our variables in our ideal gas law. But they give us pressure, volume, temperature, and we know our R. So what we're going to do is look for our N. Our P is 1 atm. Our volume is 0.663 liters, um, N. And then we're going to divide by RT to get our N. temperature is going to be 2, 298, because that is room temperature in Kelvin. Kelvin doesn't have degrees. Our N um, value is going to be 0 0.0271 moles. But we're not looking for moles. We're looking for the molar mass of the gas. And coincidentally, um, they give us the amount that we have, right? So our molar mass is what we're trying to find. Um, we don't know the identity of this element, so we can't use the periodic table to look for it. But we can find it if we divide the grams, divide by the moles, to give us however many grams per one mole. And when we do that, we find that this is 46.1, if you set up a proportion. So that's going to be your answer. Yes? Okay. Um, okay, so I just used the redensity formula. Okay. And I knew that density times gram per liter. Mm -hmm. And then I just did 1.25 over 0.66. Can I do that or no? You did 1.25 over? 0.66 liters. And then I just said that equals the molar mass times P over 0.66. So you found the density. Mm -hmm. So you found density, and then you did what to it? You found the density, and you set it equal to this, yeah. to find this. Yeah. That would work. Okay. That would work, yes. Um, I don't even think of that, to be completely honest. But yeah, the math is fine. It completely works. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I just looked at it. I don't know if it was Either way is fine. Either way is fine. For me, when I look at this, and they ask for molar mass, and they give me the grams, I'm like, oh, all I need to find is moles. And I can easily find that using PV equals NRT. So like I said, there's always more than one way to do the problem correctly, and as long as the math is sound, it's fine. Yeah. So that was the end of, um, what is it, chapter s five? <sighs> um, what else do you guys want to do? I have like five minutes before I need to end. Wait, where at the end of chapter five, we did uh, rate of attrition stuff. OK. Because rate A is going to give molar mass B over temperature. OK. For Chem 1B kids, did you guys also do rate of effusion? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, is that the room mean square stuff? Is that what that is? Because it's like the table. Uh huh. So, I mean, technically it is a 1B review. And so if they, yeah. But I mean, 
Um, have you gone to any other like 2045 reviews? There's one like right here. Yeah. They'll probably go over it. If you, th there is a difference slightly at the end of five after what you guys need to cover as opposed to the 1B. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, if they didn't need to cover it, then I'm not going to go over it. Yeah, yeah <coughs> but um, what else did you guys want to go over? Oxidation state stuff. Okay. Um, I'm just going to give you like the rules that you need to follow, right? So the first thing is that anything in its natural state needs to be zero. The oxidation number is going to be zero. Um, what that means is any metal, like sodium, potassium, whatever, if it's if it has a parenthesis S, that means it's in its natural state because metals naturally are solids, right? So if you have magnesium solid uh, just by itself, its oxidation state is going to be zero. Or if you have something like O2 gas. That is the natural state of oxygen, right? This is going to be zero. But if they give you something like O gas, not in its natural state, because oxygen is naturally diatomic. Um, so those are some easy pitfalls. But like, um, typically, anything in its natural state is going to be zero. Just watch out for things that are diatomic and not shown as diatomic. Next thing is that oxygen and fluorine always get what they want. This is going to be negative 2 and negative 1 respectively, because those are the most electronegative elements on the table. So those are the oxidation numbers you assign first. They always get those numbers. There is one exception to oxygen, and it is in H2O2. That's hydrogen peroxide. And that's actually a pretty common question. That, like, it's, it's likely that you could see this on an exam. Um, so in this one, oxygen's oxidation state is going to be negative 1, and hydrogen's is going to be positive 1. So it is only in this situation then where oxygen won't get a negative 2 oxidation state. My god, I'm breaking out. <laughs> um, number three is that for everything else, I think about 50 or 60 percent of the time, its charge will be equal to its oxidation number. It's not always. It's not always. That's just a general rule. Remember how in SO4 2 minus, um, sulfur likes to take on an S2 minus. Naturally, it is an anion, right? Um, so in this case, oxygen always gets what it wants, right? So oxygen is going to get a negative 2. And you have four oxygens. So the sum of all of those oxidation states is going to be negative 8, right? But um, the oxidation numbers of every single atom inside a polyatomic atom have to add up to the charge. Have to add up to the this charge, charge. yes. Okay. Um, so in order to compensate for that, sulfur is going to take on a positive 6 charge which doesn't really break any rules, right? Typically, it wants to turn into S2 minus. But if you look on the periodic table, sulfur is in group 6A, which it doesn't ever turn into 6 plus. But for the purposes of oxidation state, that's what it's going to do. Okay. If it was um, PO4, 3 minus, right? Oxygen is always going to negative 2. And you have 4, so that's negative 8, right? And to get to negative 3, what's phosphorus going to be? positive 5. And phosphorus is in the fifth row, or fifth column mm -hmm. in the periodic table. So if it takes on a weird number that is not typically its charge, it's going to match the number of its um, column. So basically, you get O as a negative 2 charge, mm -hmm. and then you multiply this times the 4, mm -hmm. and that gives you negative 8. Yes. And then you use zero to, it has to be um, negative 3. Yes. And that phosphorus is in its fifth mm -hmm. row, which is four, 5. Yes. Okay. And so what matters when you're looking at redox is up here, right? So this negative 2 is oxygen's oxidation number. This negative 8 is only for us to make sure that we're getting the right oxidation number for phosphorus, right? So if we have an equation and oxygen has another negative 2, you're not going to say, oh, negative 8 turns into negative 2. Mm -hmm. Because oxidation, oxygen's oxidation number here is still negative 2. It's not negative 8. This is only for the sum. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I have 10 minutes left. Um, I want you guys, so this is like the dedicated time for like questions. So ask away for the next 10 minutes. Or if you don't have any, I can keep going through the questions. It's really up to you guys. There's four. Everything's in chapter four. All your stoichiometry and all that is in chapter four. 
limiting reaction, like in general, like determining which one is limiting reactant? Um, yeah. Is that what you guys have trouble with? Yeah. Okay. Before I do a problem, um, I'm going to re-explain how I go through and find limiting reactant, right? So say that I have, um, has, has, have you guys ever heard of like the bicycle example for like limiting reactant? Okay, I'm going to give you like a pizza example, okay? So say in order to make a pizza, okay, you need three slices of cheese and let's say you need like eight pepperonis, okay? And that's a complete pizza. In fact, that's a really bad pizza, but that's just an example. <laughs> So let's say uh, you go to the store, okay, and you're like, I'm going to make a pizza. Um, and cheese only comes in packs of 20. And pepperoni only comes in packs of 20 as well. So you get one pack of cheese and one pack of pepperoni, and you have 20 for each, right? And you're like, okay, how many pizzas can I make? Well, it turns out that if you want to use all of your pepperoni, Okay, so I'm going to write cheese and pepperoni. And cheese, you need three to eight. That's your ratio, right? So if you want to use all of your pepperoni and you use all 20 pepperoni slices, then in order to make a proper pizza, you're going to need three cheeses for every eight pepperonis that you, that you use, right? So that's going to be 60. It's going to be five slices. No, it's not. Is it? This is just an example. Wait, that doesn't seem right. Yes, it is. I think I yes, it is. Yeah. So you have. So if you want to use all twenty of your pepperoni, right? You need five slices of cheese, and you have. Wait, this is so weird. You have. Okay. Yeah. So you have enough cheese to make that pizza, right? Because you have twenty slices of pepperoni. And you have more than five slices of cheese. You already bought more than sli five slices of cheese, so that's fine. That's scenario one, right? Good pizza. You make however many pizzas you can from that. And then if you use all 20 slices of cheese, you're like, okay, how many slices of um, pepperoni do I need for that? Well, for every three slices of cheese, you need eight slices of pepperoni. So that's 160 divided by three. What is that? Right? You don't have that many, that many pepperonis. So in this case, your pepperoni is your limiting reactant. Because in scenario one, everything's fine. You use all your pepperoni and you have an excess of cheese. But in scenario two, you think about this and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to use all of my cheese. And if I want to use all of my cheese, I don't have enough pepperoni to make the pizzas that I need. Yes? So technically, like if you look at it, mm -hmm. if you look at the entire problem, mm -hmm. the more I really wouldn't think of it that way. It's like dangerous to make like really like big assumptions like that just because it's difficult to tell from a glance, mm -hmm. especially because they always give it to you in grams. They don't give it to you in moles. Okay. So you have to convert it to moles and then you have to do all of this, okay. right? So I wouldn't think of it that way. It's kind of, it's, I wouldn't make any assumptions <laughs> with limiting reactant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, and that's, that's it's always because they give it to you in grams. And the conversion for everything is different mm -hmm. because you have to use a molar mass yeah. in order to convert. So you should check both ways. Scenario one, I use all of my reagent A. Mm -hmm. Do I have enough reagent B? If the answer is yes, then don't worry about it and go to scenario two. Mm -hmm. And then if I use all of my reagent B, do I have enough reagent A? And if the answer is no, then reagent A is your limiting reactant. Does that make sense? Limiting reagent, I think, is not hard to do math-wise. It's pretty easy, because you guys know how to do all the stoichiometry. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of sorting out the concept in your head, kind of being like, OK, well, I don't actually, I can't tell which one's a limiting reactant. And it's just, it's a matter of being like, OK, I use all of this. Do I have enough of the other? Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. Any other questions? How do you guys feel about things like Lewis or hybridization? or? Good. Okay. I mean, what I would do is just go through stoichiometry questions and go through gas law questions. Not gas law, th thermochem questions. Um, those are, everything in math 
and, and Chem 1A was pretty math heavy from what I remember. Oh, and um, do you go through some of the, like, like it seemed like busy work, but it wasn't. They will test you on it. Things like, um, is this a mixture or a pure substance? What is oh, yeah, Dalton's law of constant? Huh? Yeah, and, yeah, and emulsions and things like that. Yeah, I would just give that like a cursory glance over um, because, you know, you did learn it and it's going to be on your exam. Um, also learn things like um, the gold foil experiment or oh, yeah. the plum pudding model. Like, you know, these are things that we forget about, but you, you did learn all of that. Um, I just, I know that that's not something that you guys need help with. That's like a, I need to sit down and read about. Um, but a lot of this kind of stuff, um, like limiting reagent, I was like, okay, if I had to pick, I would rather give them five questions on limiting reagent because, yeah. So that's all going to be, um, all of my work is going to be uploaded to the website up there. Um, and I can show you guys how to get to there. They're all closed. It's it's because of the football game. They'll be open tomorrow. Yeah. So you guys go to stu ucfstudyunion.wordpress.com, and there's a chemistry tab. Right. When you go to chemistry, control F, uh, stun me, and then you'll see this and that. So this is the review, and this is the answer key. And then later tonight, I think around nine or ten, I will upload all of my work. It's going to be handwritten, so. Um, That'll be up there, and that way you guys can get the workout and know how to do everything. But yeah, I'm sorry I didn't get through everything. I honestly don't know. You guys get like 55 minutes, right? Yeah. 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 It can't be more than the number of minutes that you're allotted, because um, each question takes one or two minutes. So. Yeah. Um, since it's such a time-heavy exam, if you come across a question that you know is going to take a long time or is multi-part, just skip it and come back to it. It's important to budget your time. Every question is amount, it, it gives you the same amount of points. So do the easy ones first. Um, and then, yeah, just good luck. Make sure you sleep. Don't pull an all-nighter before the ACS. That's not wise. I, pro I promise you that's not wise. Um, and eat a breakfast, eat good breakfast if you can. Um, and yeah. And yeah, of course. Thank you guys for coming. For Chem 1B, you guys can also go to the Chem 2045 sessions because they are going over the same things as you guys. Before you guys go, I'm going to ask you to take a paper survey um, about how I did. It'll literally take you 30 seconds, so I would really appreciate it.